Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. In this episode, we shine a spotlight on the pivotal role of a counselor in a rural municipality, exploring the unique challenges and triumphs encountered in these environments. Joining us for this insightful discussion are two esteemed guests, Councillor Robin Kirpiewit from Cypress County, Alberta, and Councillor Dina Stang from Sturgeon County, Alberta. With their wealth of experience in rural municipality leadership, Robin and Dina offer invaluable perspectives on the intricacies of serving as a counselor in rural Alberta. Throughout our conversation, we'll delve into the multifaceted responsibilities of rural municipal leaders, examining the diverse issues they grapple with on a daily basis, from infrastructure development to community engagement, we'll explore the accomplishments, the challenges that shape the rural landscape. Moreover, our guests will share invaluable advice for prospective candidates considering a foyer into rural municipal politics. Drawing from their own journeys, Robin and Dina will offer for insights into the skills, mindset, and commitment required to make a meaningful impact as a counselor in rural Alberta and Canada. So join us as we embark on a journey through the hearts of rural governance, gaining insights from those who are at the forefront of shaping the future of rural communities. Please note that this episode was recorded live at the last Rural Municipalities of Alberta conference in Edmonton, in March of 2024. So this is only an audio roundtable discussion. So with that, this is Municipal Affairs. Um, both of you, thank you so much for doing this. I want to start by asking the sort of overarching question to this episode, and that is, what is life like for a rural municipal councillor here in the province of Alberta? Deanna, since you are the first time on this show, we're going to start with you. Thank you. Well, it's not a Monday to Friday, nine to five type of job. It really honestly is seven days a week um, at all hours of the day because, you know, the residents, their needs are immediate in their eyes. And so they need to share that. And so it's never a, not a 40 hour week by any stretch. Would you yeah, agree? I, I would agree. And I, I think to add to that is uh, there's no agenda. Like no. it's, it's not like you can, you don't know what to expect from one week to the next. Uh, you, know, you can have issues with water uh, co-ops at one, one meeting and uh, next thing you know, you're dealing with, uh, with governance items and, and bylaws and, and, uh, and then different opportunities that you're trying to figure out on your strat plan and how you want to get somewhere and, and where you want to go. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly not a nine to five and not something that if you have to know exactly what's happening each given day, uh, it's probably not for that person, but uh, yeah. Is it what you expect to, looking back on when you first got elected to where we are now in 2024, life of a rural municipal councillor, is it, is it anything what you expected? So in my previous lifetime, in 2004, I was a, a small town councillor and obviously in a, a small municipality, the needs were very different. We were dealing with drainage, we were dealing with the water, we were dealing with all of those types of things. Whereas the scope that I'm involved in day to day now is very different in a much larger capacity and it really is all encompassing of the day to day life of, of a resident. And, and so I had that previous experience going into my current position. I, I ran in 2013, I was unsuccessful by a small margin. But thankfully, I didn't get in then because I don't think my family would have liked me very much at that point in time. <laughs> um, I'm in a different point now where I can commit to that long, those long days and, and be really invested. And I, I think when we talk about rural counselors in, in whatever capacity, they really are invested in, in what, their, what their constituents or their residents are facing. So I feel... You know, I really take this stuff to heart and I really do find that. So, I, you know, I'm really, I pursue, I advocate. We talk about all those things in, in, in that capacity. So running in 2004 and being successful to what it looks like today is really night and day. Mm -hmm. Because even the needs of society has changed, yeah. you know, with what we deal, deal with every day. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds. But okay. I just want to get, let you answer that question before I start with the true line of questioning. Now. Yeah, well, and, and that's that was kind of where I was going to go, is that the landscape has changed so much. So, yeah, I, I would say that in some ways, yes, it's what I expected. In other ways, no, it's, it's not. Um, I think that social media has changed so much um, and that the expectations of the public has 
has changed. And so, you know, historically speaking, I think a lot of rural counties and councils um, had the mindset that they're elected to make decisions. And, and, you know, if you don't like it, you can question us or you can hold us accountable in four years. And now I think that we are living in live time where you have, you know, almost like rallies being set up uh, while the council meeting is still going on a decision that was made at 11 and you have somebody posting something at four and setting up a, you know, a, a political action group to, you know, criticize or, or anonymous posters that are, you know, trying to influence things on on the go. And I, I think that that's something that, you know, kind of predated COVID and that predated social media that is really it's it's continuing to change uh, as we go and and it's probably affected provincial and federal uh, politics a lot more than municipal but I think in the last two years specifically I've really seen municipal government uh, being uh, you know kind of hijacked with a lot of um, misinformation uh, on what we're trying to do and uh, the intent behind it and you know it, it's uh, it's dealing with that has been difficult we talk about the challenges that rural municipal leaders are facing. One of them that I want to just talk about briefly before we get, jump into the next segment is you are a municipal leader just like your urban co- colleagues. But the issue is you aren't in your community at all times because your community spans a very vast geographic area so you don't just go down the street to go to an event you have to potentially go 25 50 kilometers down the road or into the next area to your events does the challenge of being such a a large geographic area daunt some people from getting into municipal politics because if i'm elected in ward five Mm -hmm. my count ward and there's something going on in Ward 2 that all council has to go to. That could be a day's worth of trip. And you are, I'm assuming, two full-time employees at other jobs outside of this municipal realm. Does the geographic location, the size of your community, reflect the, the diversity around your council tables, would you say? Okay. So in that capacity, like I think of uh, Sturgeon County specifically, every division, because we have six, is very different in the sense of, of what they have within. So, you know, yes, I, I can honestly boast our, our council is very active in, in each uh, individual's division. And, you know, because we want to hear those. You know, when we make decisions, we want to make it as part of the whole entire council and county and not just a, a narrow portion of. And so, yeah, you're, you are traveling from tip to tip. And, and sometimes that takes a long time. And Does it get tiresome? Some days. <laughs> Some days it's long, and but at the end, but there's pockets of time where you just take that breather, you regroup, and you refocus, and and then you're able to continue. But you know there are long days. There's no doubt there's long days. But I, as a council member, I want to be involved and I want to be informed, because there might have been a point of view shared that day that my division doesn't even have a grasp on. But yet it gave me a better understanding. And so, you know, again, I'm going to boast about our council. We were very active in everyone's division. So we have that level of knowledge. Mm. And with with mine, I think it's a little bit different in that we've got a couple of hamlets within Cypress County. And, uh, you know, those are kind of gathering places where, you know, we might have some school board issues or having conversations about development. Uh, My ward, um, I have like maybe a handful of business uh, and the rest of it's all ag with some multi you know residential subdivisions and and so you know we're not doing a lot of events in ward four first per se but there's definitely a lot in desert bloom there's a lot in in uh, dunmore and Irvine and in seven persons and you know so we try to get out there and, and see that but it's cypress county is a big a big uh, county like from the, the southern tip to the northern tips probably an hour and a half to two hours but we're not spending as much time on that driving i, I think that in, in our area more than anything it's just if we want we don't do a ton of evening meetings and stuff as well and uh, the evening meetings would be something I'd be game on seeing a little bit more of just to try to get more engagement and and uh, and buy-in from the public because you know if, from an inclusivity standpoint a lot of rural councils meet during the day and it makes it difficult for you know people who have full-time jobs like luckily you know we're both you know business owners and have been or are still are and uh you know, it, it makes it a little bit easier when you have some autonomy over your own schedule. But uh, yeah, it's so. 
Does family life come into play when you're dealing with a lot of municipal issues? Because you could be sitting at a council table for 8, 10, 15 hours some days. Budgets, you could take weekends. How important is it to have a strong family foundation around you? Because you're not doing this alone. Mm-hmm. You, I, I know you, and I, I, I don't know you personally. I've been to your house. I yep. know you have lots of kids. Lots of kids. Lots of kids. <laughs> and, uh, and a so many wife. kids. <laughs> a helpful <laughs> life. How important is it to have a strong family that when you come home, you don't have to deal with the mundane stuff that you're just dealing with at the municipal council, and you can sort of escape into a different reality and just be dad again? And, is, it, is, is the family life of a I, rural counselor... Is a, there a division? I, well, I'll <laughs> tell you. I, when, I, when, I, when I come home after council, whether it was a good meeting or a bad meeting, I have a decompression stage. And uh, I think that the, the strength of my family right now recognizes leave dad alone, give him some space. And, and, that, and just knowing that I think is good because, you know, there, there is a lot that we discuss and we come home and I try not to bring too much of that into the house now you know I've, I've involved a lot of my kids they come out they do networking with us as well they, they know a lot of the members of the community and and, and of council um, but uh, yeah I think having a strong support network period whether it be family whether it be friends um, I know some councillors that their their families have very little to do with what they, they do politically um, but you need to have a support network for sure that you can bounce some things off of and, and speak to because yeah, it's uh, it's it's not it's not normal life. No. Right. Like it's not. Uh, maybe we're letting the cat out of the bag because it's not normal <laughs> uh, what we do all the time. And uh, but you you do need to have somebody that's there to 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 hold your hand and you know stroke your head every <laughs> once in a while and say it's okay. <laughs> and I can say on my perspective too, my husband is so supportive. You know, there he is a realtor, so there's not a lot of. Our schedules are a lot of conflicting dates and times, and, and but he also knows same cons, you know, same ideas. Come home from council, I could be wound a little tight, uh, and he gives me that space, but also that opportunity to to just chat and talk, and and um, because sometimes I need that different perspective to bring me down a level. And my children are all adults, and so you know when we have conversations, I, I appreciate that level of honesty that they provide to me and and i i agree like leaving them leaving work at work is, is always healthy um mm-hmm. and and creates that boundary but it does come home yeah. you know it definitely does come home and uh but I, I again i have such a supportive and loving family that they just they see me walk in they they have that gauge that barometer gauge and they yeah. just they know Okay, mom just needs a little yeah. bit of time. If she's on the treadmill, just give her 20. Yeah, yeah. mom spends a lot of time outside walking and treadmill. That's okay. That's yeah. healthy. That's good. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk around the last few months about the abuse that urban municipal leaders have been getting. Mm. Now, you are both rural municipal leaders. I've got to ask, are you seeing the encroachment of partisan abuse onto the municipal realm in rural communities like Sturgeon County, like Cypress County? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I think in some capacity, you know, there's that those lines are being blurred, whether it's federal, provincial, and whose jurisdiction is whose. And when we get down to a municipal level, where's the, and they said it best today, this morning, boots on the ground. We are knocking on our neighbors' doors and, and seeing how these changes and policies are affecting them in every capacity. And I think there's that distinction that that line is definitely bur- blurred. And yeah, we're definitely seeing it. Like I, I've got messages on my voicemail from people I have no clue who they are, that on are phone? on my phone, and and that are very disheartening. Because when I ran for for this position, I came with an open heart and an open mind, and, and I really felt that I could give to my community. And and some people don't see politics or any leader in this role right now. In that, they they're really making that you know global comment on on what's happening at a municipal level and it's really unfair it it truly is unfair because i think a lot of good work is not being done now Mm -hmm. you know people are starting to step back like uh, you know i was really worried when i heard some of the statistics out of ontario and quebec and i'd be curious to know what alberta is about people deciding not to run Mm -hmm. last year alone 54 people left uh, all across urban and uh, urban and rural municipalities in alberta 
elected leaders either walked away from the job, resigned for other reasons, but I know that number because I did a story on it mm. in January. Thank you, because I, it really is, it does. You, it's it's the hard. highest in the last four years, I should yeah. say, as well. It's hard not to take some of this stuff to heart. You know, yeah. you, you do want to wear that Teflon suit and, and just think this is a job, but no, we're invested in it wholeheartedly, and, and you have to take it a little personally sometimes. Yeah. Well, I know you and I talked uh, last summer too, and and I, I think I addressed at that time just the public's approach right now, and and in public, and even the professional approach to uh, to discourse and disagreement. Um, we we've ventured away from respectful disagreement, and we need to get back to that point. Like you know, gone are the days where you could argue and debate and then go out and have a drink afterwards now it's like you can agree on 85 90 percent of the stuff and if they hear one item that you disagree with them on you're you're instantly disregarded and, and we we really have to start pushing past that because i think that respect and dignity is something that we've lost uh you know in our society and we we need to return to that uh for sure because i may not have dealt with it as much in my area um as, as what you're seeing but like I, i've got a pile of friends and colleagues that that um, deal with it and the the amount of uh, just it, it's, it's it's irrational anger that's being directed at individuals be it for political reasons or for you know, uh, I, I, you know way too many women in politics that are great strong leaders that are just really changing the demographic and and some people just are uncomfortable with it and uh, and then they're being targeted personally for it and stuff like that we, we we're bigger than that we need to get past it how do we get past it though because we're sitting here right now mm -hmm. and I, every municipal leader I've ever talked to has always said this saying if you have a problem come to me with a solution because I don't want to have to come up with a solution I want us to come up with a solution together mm -hmm. now you have an organization like RMA you have organizations like FCM what can organizations like them and what can your own communities do to sort of stop the abuse because if you don't the next generation of politicians are going to say, I don't want this. Yeah. I don't want to deal with what Deanna or Robin's been dealing with. Yeah. How do we stop this now so it doesn't become a uh, epidemic yeah. where people, and I don't apologize for saying pandemic. No, I, I hear you. Want, yeah. want to say it's that. not a trigger I'm anymore. Not, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not trying to trigger anyone right now. But how do we stop this from becoming bigger than it already has become? If I can make a comment, and it's really an overarching comment in the sense that this is what I've noticed. Yep. I, I noticed this when I was knocking on doors in 2021. Our sense of community has really honestly gone by the wayside. Like, you know, you think of your own childhoods, and I, I grew up in a small town. Everybody knew each other. There was that, that trust with your neighbor. There was that understanding and that respect. And, and I really feel today... It's an online community. It's not a physical, in your space type community. And, and, you know, knocking on doors, I had, you know, neighbors lived in those spaces for more than 30 years and had never met their neighbor. Mm. You know, so when you talk about those types of issues, whether it's crime, whether it's mental health, all of these things, our sense of community is gone. Mm. And how do we build that? And that's kind of been what I've been focusing on in. in my advocacy and, and the things that I've been pushing hard for is creating that community and that safe space because we can agree to disagree. We, we grew up very differently and we have very different points of view on most things, but we have to be respectful and we can we can agree to disagree and yeah. move past it. Yeah. And people can't move past it anymore. Mm -hmm. the, that community as a whole has really been shattered. And who's to blame? I, I really don't know who's to blame so on I'm that. I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that for a second. If Absolutely. You don't mind. Bring so it on. <laughs> is, it, is it the sense of community is gone or is it the sense of the community that once was is gone? Because now the community True. is online and I can find anyone online who agrees exactly what I Absolutely. In, or I can find someone who I agree with and I can just find that community online. Yeah. So is the sense of community that, okay, we're all going to go down to the arena on Saturday morning, we're all going to watch the two local teams play against each other gone, and yeah. now it's more, we're going to go on social media and complain about what's going on at council. Yeah, or no, that was a very good distinction. <laughs> <laughs> or Ottawa. very good point. No, your distinction is correct in the sense that it was that those face-to-face -face conversations, yeah. you know, those those opportunities to engage. You know, we talked about volunteerism the other day at an event, and we see it in every community across Canada. Mm -hmm. Volunteer Volunteerism is dropping at a substantial rate. Everyone's hiding behind their computers, and really, these programs, a lot of boys and girls clubs, a lot of these senior programs, 
they're run by volunteers, mm -hmm. which is a sense of community. A and that's what I'm going back to is what we had before, so back the, in the old days. So <laughs> how do we challenge that? Because you can't be in 100% of your your geographic location of your boundary or district or your ward. Yeah. So social media is something that you have kind of tried to rely on a yeah. little bit. And I say that respectfully to anyone who's listening. I despise social media. I have to use it because I have to get the show out. But yeah. I don't like it because yeah. I don't interact with people. It's just it's a cesspool of negativity, in my opinion. Tell how us how you really feel. That is my yeah. truth. <laughs> That's my opinion. If you want to send your emails, please send them to me. Um, how do rural counselors overcome the obstacles that come with social media and use it at, in a good sense to ensure that you're exchanging the free flow of ideas, yeah. but also connecting with a community that is in with that community that Dan has talked about. So I'm going to answer your, your, your question by referring to a, a real life situation that I had when I was kind of at my tail end of my time with FCM. And uh, we were talking about the, the opportunity that municipal politicians have. And it's unique because we aren't partisan. We don't have parties behind us yet. And uh, but the the reality is is that we we have boots on the ground. We have the ability to take a position and and to lead by example. And uh, you know, when it when it comes down to, it, I think that's ultimately our biggest responsibility is to inform. And I think that that's where social media can be utilized and and media in, in general. Like I know that there's a lot of uh, of you know, concern uh, amongst, uh, while well, we're in Alberta and a lot of the, the, the more right-leaning politicians with regards to the legacy media and, and things like that. But, you know, I have a very good relationship with my media friends and partners because they're there to help tell a story of what's going on. And when you have leaders in the community that are making a stand on things, that needs to become a part of the story. Um, way too many times in my council meetings, I've made statements that should be front page news and they don't get talked about because they aren't as flashy, but they're, they're cultural and they're, they're specific and, and we need to tell those stories and, and, uh, and we need to be a little bit more in control of our own narrative, which is why I think we have that responsibility to, to share our story on, on, you know, on whether it's Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever that might be. But to try to tell the story of what we're trying to do and we have to lead by example and and be prepared to to debate and and you know as much as social media can be that that steaming cesspool at times of negativity i i think that there are certain times where i may choose to engage with somebody if i know that they're the kind of person that is willing to engage with a certain level of decorum. trust decorum yeah and uh because there are people that are still out there. Not everybody's a keyboard warrior that's hiding under an anim anonymity, right? And uh, and so we have to find ways to engage. I think that's one of the, the ways where we've really struggled in the last little bit is that we make a decision and we aren't prepared to stand in front of a room of 300 people that are yelling and screaming and let them yell and scream a little bit, let them wear themselves out, answer questions, be there, listen. My parents always said, you got two ears and one mouth, take a hint. Um, it might have had something to do with my energy level, but you know, it, it's a good it's a good pointer, and, and uh, I think that if we can start to demonstrate what active listening looks like, then maybe we can start to uh, to change the direction that we go on that. Do you find yourself being bum? I don't want to say bombarded, but are you, do you find the the role of the rural municipal councillor being sort of put on the same level as the MPP or MLA, M MP, or even your big city uh, uh, colleagues, whether it be Calgary or Edmonton, because people are looking at you and saying, you need to fix everything because you're the closest to them and you know all the issues and I have my my road that's been washed away because of the flood mm -hmm. and rural leaders are now being asked to do more, and I hate to say this and I say it all the time, but yeah. more with less. Yeah. So, are you finding that more and more people are just wanting you to do everything and you just can't at the end of the day? Ooh, that's a loaded one. Um, 
Because you talk about the jurisdictional roles, and it's the one thing that yeah. I love to talk about on the show because yeah. I think there has been a massive blurring of jurisdictional lines in our Absolutely. society. Absolutely. The average person, and I say this to those who are listening right now, the average person does not understand what the government does in Ottawa, what the government does in Edmonton, and what the government does in your own municipalities. Yeah. They think you can fix health care, you can fix education, you can fix my passport issue. Right. How do you challenge people to say it's not our jurisdiction without seeming like you're just passing the buck? Mm-hmm. And those conversations happen. Like, honestly, you, you talk. <laughs> I, so I'm going to give you a case in point. I've got a gravel road in my division that is a provincial highway. Mm-hmm. And it is a bone in my backside because it's never taken care of properly. So it's that jurisdictional conversation. And, and the residents, the MLA has now come on board and is taking care of that road appropriately. But it, it's that because they the can see it. does the average resident care? They do. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Do they, they care. care that it's a provincial road, though? No. They yeah. don't care that it's a provincial road to them. They know. They, those those residents along that road, they know who's, who's to... But they also know that my big voice will get heard a little bit better than their little voice. Yeah. And, and really, that's the role that I take is, okay, I, first I will explain that, that whatever jurisdiction it is, but I said, but my role as this divisional counselor is to advocate for you. So if this is a concern for you, that is my role. And then yeah. I will continue to advocate in that capacity every yeah. opportunity. And our local MLA will attest to that because I'm in his face often about different different things. And yeah. But it, that's my role because yeah. I'm giving a voice to those who don't. Well, and part, part of what we do is educating. And then a lot of it has to do with uh, expectation management, oh, right? Yes. And, you know, and, and sometimes expectation management happens through education. And I find like, I, I, we have a very similar situation right now and that, that gravel road goes right by a Hutterite colony. And, you know, it was, it was really dangerous and it was bad. And, and yeah, they, they care. But, you know, we have the ability with our roles to communicate and work with our colleagues at the provincial and federal levels. And sometimes that means coming up to RMA and cornering the transportation minister and saying, hey, just want to remind you, I know we've talked about this in the past, but this continues to be an ongoing issue. And like you said, that's a challenge for the, the residents to do, to be able to do. And uh, our roles give us access and opportunity at different times to connect with some of those leaders and the ministers and the departments that uh, allow us to be able to you know, represent at the provincial level the, the municipal needs. You are both not the stereotypical rural counselor that many people might think of. They might think of an old white person with white hair sitting in a room. I said hair. Yeah. Do we have anything against people without hair? No, come on now. No comments on the peanut gallery. Um, so this is a sort of a culture shift that we're seeing right here around this table because you don't go, uh, you don't adhere to the stereotypes that people have about rural counselors. When you come to events like RMA, are you seeing the change? Because you've both been counselors for some time now. Mm-hmm. You First term. Beforehand, yeah, though, as yeah, well. Yeah. So you have seen the sort of the shift in the demographics. Are you seeing more and more people in your own community saying, okay, maybe it isn't just for that old 70-year-old person. Don't get me wrong. They mm-hmm. all have their own unique yeah. voices and they have the right to run. But maybe my I'm a 35-year-old just a newly married guy or woman who wants to run and maybe I, I could be that next counselor like Robin or like Deanna. Mm-hmm. And, and you know why did like I think of this analogy too is everyone runs for a purpose. <laughs> what? What? Yeah. Right? And, and I can honestly say I really didn't run on the last election on an agenda. I, I really put my heart on my sleeve and said I I can be your voice. I can do better. Uh, you know, but I didn't have specific items on their agenda and and I think that that's the difference in like that's what was successful for me because I wasn't coming in negative I was coming in talking about solutions okay we're having this problem this problem this is how I think that we could fix it what do you think it was a a different shift and you're absolutely right the shift is happening and you're seeing more women in politics which has been the gone by the wayside for a long period of time they were at home they were doing other you know working out and, and whatnot so there is that shift and it brings a different level of understanding that we're not there yet by any stretch but i hope it's making a a change 
incrementally. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask a very political question. I apologize. I will get you. Okay. Get, but you just brought up something, and I apologize if this comes out of left field, but I feel like I can ask it in this safe setting. <laughs> We talk about the old white man's club that sat around the table 20, 30 years ago, even today. As a woman in a rural municipal municipality, do you ever find yourself looking like you have to speak louder to have your voice heard in sort of that male-dominated, white, older white gentleman-dominated uh, sort of industry? Okay, so if you asked the right person for this, <laughs> in the sense that my other day job comes from manufacturing okay. heavy equipment, fully, fully man-dominated yes. industry, and I was in that industry for almost 30 years. So I learned very quickly what words to use, and, and your voice does need to be louder, and it needs to be on point, and, and um, the respect will come if the if the right words are used Mm -hmm. and and really that's the important thing is is when any person comes into this role no matter what their gender is you have to speak intelligently and you have to be respectfully and and really i'm hoping that women are doing that more and more Uh, we've got some very strong leaders in our like i can say honestly in our council we have an amazing mayor who is so strong and very very poignant on her position and I respect that and I look up to to how she handles herself on a day to day we were in an event last week and she was surrounded and she held her head high and she was very very she adapted very quickly and and was able to to handle all of those questions and and comments because some were a little off off color but she handled them well and I'm seeing that more and more as like at every one of these events we're seeing more and more women which is good we need that balance it should it be a women dominated area absolutely not but we need that balance to for society really for you robin and yet again i'm not trying to ask that stereotypical question but i have to do you find that because i look at your demographic of your council and you are on the younger end Mm -hmm. if not the youngest on your council correct me if i'm wrong do you find that you have to speak up a little bit louder because they oh you're that young whippersnapper and we're not going to have to deal with Robin this week we can deal with this on our own because we can just sit here and vote as a majority yeah I, I think that there's a couple of cultural items that come into rural politics that that are maybe something that is significantly different than in the urban settings and uh, I'll use the example of you know growing up on the on the ranch but you got your grandpa in the corral and your dad in the corral and then you in the corral and and uh, you never think about telling your grandpa how to do it because he's been doing this for 65 years Um, and I think that there's an element of um, you know sharing sharing the chambers with others recognizing the contributions that everybody brings and it's not all about life experience and life lift Um, everybody brings their own skill set and and just like you know there are there are challenges that are out there for the strong female leaders that are are trying to make a make their go um, I know I've I've experienced it as being one of the younger guys and I, I think that that is a challenge and we bring in again you that kind of that generation X or that dot com generation where you know in the middle of a meeting we can access information at the snap of a finger and uh, you know a couple of years ago I think RMA they asked the question how many of you in the room get your your news from online and it was like 15 20 percent um, you know my generation it's it's 95 percent 100 percent and uh, access to information is so quick and the way that we think is different and and so you know there's there's challenges that come with that and I know that uh, having worked with the, uh, the FCM board it, it same applies with uh, people with eth- ethnic backgrounds that are in in uh, rural communities in Ontario and and all over the place so challenges challenges exist for sure but you know you you push through and I think that we run and and uh, Deanna, you know, you said you, you ran with no agenda, but you're, I, I see what you bring to your council and that solution oriented, that drive, that it, to me is is uh, it, 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 there's so much value in in that and uh, and I think that you just when you're principled and you're you know that you're doing the right thing for the right reason, you you push through because you're not just fighting for yourself, you're fighting for everybody else that might identify with you and when, when what you're trying to do. Now I'm conscious of time here, I just looked down and we're at 32 minutes because of course we're talking to Robin, it's going to be 32 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's Sorry. totally fine. That's I okay. apologize. Um, so- I want to talk about the next generation because I have seen an abundance of municipal elections go by 
where the, the, the acclimation rate is getting higher and higher and higher. More and more people do not look at the role of a municipal councillor as something as achievable or even fun that, that yeah, it was. To be desired. Because yeah. 20 years ago, you would sit one day a month at a council meeting. Now you are on the road 24-7. It is a full-time job with part-time pay, and I say that respectfully. Mm-hmm. What do you tell the next generation, the people younger than you both, say... I want to be a municipal politician. Well, maybe it's not for you. Or I, I'm thinking about becoming, I'm thinking about running in five years when you decide to retire or move on or decide to do whatever you want to do. What do you tell the next generation of rural municipal leaders about what the job entitles and what the job is like? There's a lot of sides and, to that. <laughs> and are you looking, are you seeing people in your own communities who might be prospective candidates that you can say, you know, one day I can see little Johnny or little Susie potentially sitting around this council with me or maybe not with me and making these decisions on the betterment of our, their own community. And you know what I can, so in Sturgeon County, we brought in a youth advisory council. Mm-hmm. And so their primary, there's 12 between 16 and 24. And it's a very diverse group of young people and their mandate is to advise council on policy changes anything that we so they give us their opinion from their perspective and i can say from that from that lens sitting on that uh, committee or board that i see some perspective leaders in that group and and um and they're learning they are taking these little bits and snippets because we, you know, as counselors, myself and Councillor Thomas, we we bring a, a report back to them on the same level as they are doing for us, and so they're taking. You can see it, and you can see the interest growing and and the understanding growing, and I definitely see some young leaders in there. And and my comment to them is always to educate themselves as best as possible. Mm-hmm. If, if there is, you know, we talk about different agenda items and and whatnot. If there's something very passionate. Um, educate yourselves on all the perspectives because there's not just a black and a white that's all the shades of gray <laughs> and and they have to understand that so I, I see potentially leaders out there I honestly do and there's some amazing kids out there who are really getting the wrong side of the rap because you know they're not just hiding behind the keyboards you mm-hmm. know they are living life and and they bring a different perspective so I really hope that that our generation doesn't squash it for them yeah. and, and bring that negativity and whatnot, honestly, because there is so much potential in, in our youth today I, that yeah. they have so much to bring to the table. I think you hit the nail on the head is that it, like any organization where transitional planning is important, um, I think that the existing councils have to do a, a better job at recruiting and encouraging people to run and, and not have it be so um, adversarial. Uh, to run for council should not be seen as a, as a personal attack against the council that's in. It needs to be seen as a, an act of, of, of civil um, uh, responsibility and, and opportunity to, to get involved. And uh, frankly, when you have somebody that's been on council for 20 years, 25 years, and you have somebody that's young and motivated and, and you know, there needs to be some encouragement to kind of take on that legacy type of position where maybe you you uh, encourage them to get involved and you take on more of a mentorship kind of a role because you know if you're not if you're not growing if you're not progressing you're you're dying and uh, and we see that right now and and I don't think that like I, I grew up in politics I never dreamt about being a municipal politician um, yet. See, I, I find that hard to believe. I can imagine little Robin running around, going out of order. Well, and, and <laughs> I, but like that was that was more like the the provincial or federal. Like I, that was, and we talked about that in our in our last chat. Um, but it was municipal. It just it kind of seemed less flashy, right? It, it's it's more, um, you know, get get dirty, put your gloves on, get out to work, and and uh, and so I think that. It's quite normal to have discourse and then people, you know, get involved because they're not happy with where things are at. And uh, and I, I've, we've seen that in all over the last couple of elections where they come in, they go, oh, wow, this is way different than I expected it to be. Mm-hmm. And maybe I wouldn't have quite been so hard on you guys had I known all the information that was there. And But that, again, comes down to we need to make sure that we're spreading a lot of that information so that people see it and that they're getting involved because 
they want to be a part of the solution, not that they want to oust the problem. Because the reality is, that the councils are not the problem. Um, it's how you know. Do you want to be a part of the solution? So you asked, what would you say to a kid? It's like, what kind of a community do you want to live in? And then the next question is, what are you doing to make that a reality? Mm-hmm. And council is just one of those ways. You can be a part of clubs too, and uh, and help out the community as a volunteer, or get involved in council, learn some things, and maybe you'll go somewhere else from there. Last question to both of you. Looking back on your time in elected office for a long time, brief time, has it been fun? I really do enjoy what I'm doing. I honestly do because I I do see the positive changes happening. And I mentioned incrementally, I do see that. And I, I feel privileged to be a part of that process. And am I done yet? No, I'm not done yet. There's been moments of fun. There's been moments of heartbreak. There's been moments of being infuriated. Um, And then there's been moments of just, you know, that what you're doing has a purpose. And I think that at the end of the day, you look at it and you can't ask yourself the question, you know, am I doing it because it feels good? Uh, I think that at the end of the day, you look back and you say, what did I leave this better than I found it? And uh, can I be proud of the of the track record and the the voting record that I held? And can I go to sleep with my head held high or, you know, feeling good about what I've done? And uh, it's been worth every moment through the pain and the tears at times. Um, And yes, there has been a lot of fun and meeting people like Deanna and and her council and, and people like you, Chris, you know, it's uh, the reality is, is that um, we find people that we have commonality with and, uh, and you can kind of, you can share and and support each other through some of the stresses too. And uh, and it it, it forms a big family. Both of you, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance and the decisions government make in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged on the issues at hand municipally. Your support, though, is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.